Um, okay, yeah, so I mean, it's a small audience, so you know, please feel free to interrupt and ask me questions. Uh, hopefully not too hard questions about economics and things like that. I am a computer scientist, uh, but uh, ask me questions and we can have a discussion, dialogue, um, run out of time, that's great. Don't run out of time, we can eat more food. So it sounds like a good plan to me. Um, so yeah, I'm Josiah Hester, I'm in uh, the College of Computing. Uh, I am in computer science, interactive computing. I do computer engineering, embedded systems, and things like that. I'll talk a little bit more about my own work, but I also hope that this can give an overview of where I think computing generally is in terms of sustainability and different ways and factors that uh, we can think about how to influence sustainability and uh, push back against climate degradation. All right, so this should be, you know, not news at all, right? Uh, we have this unfortunate, you know, difficult climate disaster from climate degradation and global heating. Uh, there's kind of the pessimistic start to all of these types of uh, lectures, at least from what I've seen. But I'll just put this here, but also note that we'll end with a bit of optimism, even though many things are kind of in dire situations, including many of the communities that we actually work with uh, to help mitigate some of these effects. Uh, one of the ways I like to think about this, uh, I don't know if like is the best word, but you know, this past summer, which was pretty hot in Atlanta um, and also in Chicago, where I was recently, uh, was you know one of the coolest. It was a hot summer, but it was one of the coolest of the rest of our lives. All right, so things are advancing and getting a bit worse, and unfortunately, our adaptations are coming a bit late, according to um, the IPCC 2022 report. Uh, the evidence is here. Uh, we have some strategies, but they're not being implemented as fast as we could hope. And unfortunately, a lot of the future climate risks that we thought were farther in the future are kind of here right now. And that's really uh, unfortunate and difficult and dire. And so now we're in the space of, you know, okay, what are the mitigation strategies that we can enact to help preserve human life, livelihood, and happiness? So I'll throw this in because I feel like you can't come to Atlanta Georgia without having a Jimmy Carter quote. Um, and this is a pretty good one from you know, 50 years ago. Uh, I'll let you read it, but you know, Jimmy Carter, favorite, favorite son of Georgia, um, said this nearly half a century ago, right? That we need to address this you know, unsustainable resource use. Otherwise, things are going to get difficult. We need to enact some type of change before change is really forced on us in hard ways. Uh, and unfortunately, here we are, you know, half a century later. And according to the IPCC report um, this year, action on adaptation has increased. It's been positive. Um, mitigation strategies and meeting um, uh, promises has gone better, but it's uneven and we're not really adapting fast enough. Okay, so that's that broader picture, right, where computing uh, exists. And so what does computing, you maybe might ask, um, have to do with sustainability? And I'm apologize that I'm using this word sustainability is a very broad term, but it's kind of the point, right? So that we can think about it in a, a very diverse and holistic way. Uh, so this talk is really about the ways computing is contributing, adding to this uh, crisis that we've talked about, and also some hopeful ways of how we're already seeing a lot of great ideas, um, not you know just from me, not just from our areas, but from a lot of different researchers around the world on how to address the impact of computing, as well as how to use computational artifacts and systems uh, to make the world you know, a, a bit better, to push back against uh, climate change and to come up with very powerful innovations and mitigations. All right, so but before we get to that, just to make sure we're all on the same page, because um, sometimes you know, I'll talk to people and they'll be like, oh, Netflix, yeah, I watched my videos, but that's not computing. So I wanna make sure we're all like on the same page of computing is in this fabric of everything we do in society. So we're looking at emissions, if we just think of a carbon footprint that come from a lot of different places as shown in this slide, right? So things that we traditionally associate with computing like uh, social media, large scale data storage, scientific computing, um, weather forecasting, all kinds of these things happen in data centers, right? It's very large places that to have a bunch of compute power centralized in the resource have very high operating costs um, and but provide a lot of you know benefit for a lot of very important applications that we use in daily life. Of course, some are more important than others, and I'm not going to comment on social media versus weather prediction, but you can make your own choices there. There's also mobile and IoT and phones, you know, things we have in our pockets, on our wrists, um, but also things that are throughout buildings, right? 
um, smart farming, smart agriculture, all these industries that use computational intelligent devices to help make decisions uh, and to have autonomous long-term sensing. Right? So this could also even include robotics and other things that are kind of emerging uh, in a big way. I mean, you know, everything from the Roomba um, to the, the sensor in the factory to the sensors in your car. And then there's this third category, um, which honestly, in terms of sustainability, we don't know a lot about yet in terms of carbon footprint, but these emerging computing paradigms, right? So we've probably heard quantum computing, quantum supremacy, those terms are thrown around often in the context of national security um, or homeland security, things like that. But these are in, you know, important paradigms that are going to change the landscape of, of um, sustainability once again by providing new ways to do computing, as well as using resources to enable this kind of computational mechanism. So those are kind of the three places, but what is the actual footprint? So again, this is the kind of the bird's eye view, and I'll really put a big um, caveat note on this, that these numbers are were drawn uh, from publications that worked with companies, um, Google, Meta, Amazon, and they provided this information uh, willfully, and this information is a bit old. It's fine. Uh, but at the time when this was done, about 2019, uh, computing environmental footprint was about 700, it's dragging people in, uh, 700 million tons of CO2, which is near equivalent at the time um, and I'm not sure, I can't remember if they accounted for COVID-induced pandemic flights, but uh, about half of the aviation industry's footprint. Right. So that's, you know, pretty large, right? Um, we're, of course, maybe getting a lot of benefit for this, uh, but that's a pretty significant footprint. So that also means that things we might be able to change could have an impact. The big thing about this is while there may be a limit on planes we can put in the sky, uh, the amount of computing is just rapidly increasing and it's troubling because this emission will at least and by many estimates double over the next decade because of a few reasons so first we're continuing to put more people online um, this is actually a really important uh, development goal actually of getting people online so that they can participate in global economy things like that uh, but as more devices and people come online so to do emissions increase we're also every day, it feels like, discovering new applications and new ways to use computational power. Uh, it feels endless, right? Uh, things we couldn't imagine a decade ago, even five years ago, are now happening, right? Art, art being generated just by prompts, for example. Uh, and then again, maybe most troubling, but also most you know, kind of uh, quantified, the efficiency improvements that we relied on for the past 50, 60 years from Moore's Law uh, where we just kind of kept getting better and better materials, um, faster computers, but just kind of moving down to periodic tables and finding new processes, that has really peaked. And while we argue in computing at length over many beers and drinks and things like that, on whether it's truly dead, this idea of like efficiency scaling, uh, it has hit this plateau. And that has means that basically to get more efficiency out of these machines, we have to come up with better algorithms and we can't rely on just automatic hardware increase uh, improvements. So from this context, I'm kind of thinking of a few different questions that I'll try to tackle in the talk um, in this discussion, and maybe it'll seed other ideas, but uh, all of these are concerning, but let's break it up a little bit. So we're, we want to really in investigate uh, the footprint of computing a little bit farther. I'll give you some examples from uh, what Apple has released and what we know about um, data center use. Uh, I'll talk a little bit um, about what we're trying to do about it, both mostly from my work, because I'll have most familiarity there, but also what others are doing in high performance computing and things like that. Then I'll talk about kind of some of the, the bright side fun stuff of can computing enable sustainability in terms of data driven sustainability focus mitigations, um, empowering communities, uh, civic engagement, different things like that. And then we'll close with a little bit of, you know, is this really, is this all really enough? Um, and actually that one, I'll kind of leave to everyone else to talk to me about. So these are hard you know, questions, incomplete answers, of course, um, but we'll do our best. All right, so let's dig in that first one. Where does computing's carbon footprint come from? 
And so this is always, you know, this is very close to kind of what we look at in maybe civil environmental engineering, right, of life cycle analysis, right? So can we do a life cycle analysis of something like um, uh, computing's uh, emissions? And so there's a bunch of different factors here from the transportation costs of parts, maintenance, people, fuel to data centers, for example, uh, to the embedded embodied costs of manufacturing itself. It's very expensive, um, high energy process to make transistors. Uh, and then there's also things within use. So if I, every time I plug my phone in, right, and charge the battery, that's something. Um, will that be more than how much it costs to manufacture? Uh, will product use of, I have a server rack that runs for five years on full um, crunching data sets, you know, how, how will that impact this whole use case? And then there's also recycling and e-waste and these other things within this emissions impact, because recycling and taking these materials back also has an impact on how much emissions we're pr being produced within this kind of global view of computing. And so the big takeaway, though, is there are kind of two areas that we'll think of it, right? Um, at least for this presentation, it's a combination of the energy that's consumed when these computers are active and then the embodied cost, right? And that embodied cost is manufacturing plus um, the other things that would go into manufacture. So here's kind of a little bit harder numbers. Um, I think this one's from 2018 uh, data, but released in 2019 for a fairly famous um, uh, company you may all know. Um, in this example, and so, you know, Apple, uh, that, that's kind of the big caveat here is Apple dominates consumer markets, right? So these are consumer devices, um, lots of phones, iPads, laptops, uh, and you can see from here that manufacturing costs account for almost, you know, 75%, right, of the entire uh, carbon footprint of Apple, according to their data, whereas, you know, the product use itself is much, much smaller, right? So this is a bit different though, uh, when we look at the footprint of data centers. So we're actually looking at you know, the production or embodied costs in blue versus usage over three years for different devices uh, compared to the data centers. And data centers, I think this figure is from the combined um, cost of uh, Google's, Google's Microsoft, Azure's, and Amazon's. Um, so this is actually still an incomplete figure. So those numbers on the left are, you know, we can't quite compare them across, but the uh, proportion, right, of usage and operating costs to production is huge, right? So this would make you think maybe that uh, if I'm going to have a rethinking of the computational stack, right, for these two things, I need to take very different approaches. Right? So I need to figure out how to manufacture these types of devices in a much lower carbon footprint um, anyway, whereas I need to take data centers and I need to fix the use phase, uh, phase of this to still provide utility. But this, of course, will get pretty complicated um, because of a bunch of reasons, right? The internet's still growing. Uh, we're gaining worldwide users. Capacity needs to increase to support them. There's a lot more applications. So one of the things we talk about is um, Jen, you know, Jen's paradox, right? Where as we create a cheap resource to be used, people are going to invent new applications that can make use of this cheap resource. So we're making the computing more efficient by going greener in some cases, greener, quote unquote. Uh, this opens new applications to kind of take that extra. And that becomes a little more complicated, obviously, than like I can get into on the slide. And unfortunately, a lot of companies will say things like, well, we're offsetting by these carbon credits um, or these renewable energy credits. And that is difficult because many of these credits, um, as discussed in even recent um, John Oliver segment, uh, are not real or are not actual offsets or paying for something that's really not going to pay back that cost anytime soon. And so there's a bunch of kind of difficulties with accountability uh, for these embodied uh, costs versus credits. And something else that's happening is, and this is why maybe what my claim of, well, for these mobile devices, we just really need to fix the manufacturing part is my, maybe not the full picture. Because right now we're at tens of billions of these tiny, small Internet of Things devices, whereas a lot of uh, industry and admittedly self-fulfilling prophecies of industry say we will hit trillions of these devices. At that point, embodied and use costs 
change because then you have a trillion devices that last for a decade uh, versus data centers uh, that might grow more statically in number. And of course, electronic waste is accumulating rapidly. So all of that fire hose of information on like kind of where we are at the very, this very singular point in time. And that's a big kind of caveat as well, right? This is one moment in time where we're kind of looking at what's happening uh, across like the computing industry. Things change it, like the pandemic, seeing huge amounts of uh, streaming go up, completely changes emissions. Uh, different types of social trends of uh, increasing use of video, like I mentioned TikTok already, uh, are also changing the use and the scale and scope of the different computational computing services that are offered. So all of this is advancing and changing for good and for bad. And so we have to go back and think about how the fundamentals of computing itself and often the hardware, we can remix, adapt, change, whatever, uh, to kind of address this potential exponential growth in emissions. So what can we do? So there's really just, I try to simplify it down to two things, right? Um, what can we do here? It's a wicked problem, you know, so it's very, I mean, well, one solution is very easy. We just, you know, end use of all fossil fuels, but obviously that's a little outrageous. So the much more wicked parts are how do we reduce the carbon footprint of computing? Which is a very large problem across a lot of different areas, not just computer engineering, but going to materials, devices, um, and everything in between. And then can we use computing as a tool for data-driven sustainability efforts? And so this is multi-part, multi-field. So let's, I'll talk now about kind of um, how we can reduce the carbon footprint of computing just on the Internet of Things side with a few call outs to data centers. Um, because I'm not a data center guy, uh, I am a you know small devices guy, um, but I'll give a little bit more info about all of them. So this is what I was referring to when I said um, industry has some self-fulfilling prophecies I'd like to see on the number of Internet of Things devices. So Internet of Things, right? Wearables again mobile phones, sensors and walls and buildings and smart cars and all of those types of things, right? Factories, et cetera. So this was the CEO of NVIDIA when they were trying to merge with ARM. Um, there's a two of, you know, like all every graphics card in the ARM is almost every, you know, um, embedded system in the world carries these two companies. So this is a big deal when they were when they were trying to merge. And the CEO said in years ahead, trillions of computers running AI will create a new Internet of Things that is thousands of times larger than today's internet of people. Now, when I see that, I see a trillion problems, of course, and many of those problems end up being things like batteries. But for kind of taking a step back, uh, the inability of our devices to last longer than a year or two years or three years, right? And while your phone, you consider, your phone you may replace every two years, sometimes it's actually in your contract, right? But you replace this every two years. Uh, and this device as, been held in a safe spot in your pocket, temperature controlled, um, you know, very protected. You're not going to drop it in water. It's not going to get exposed to high heat or humidity. Uh, now consider Internet of Things devices that are in walls or out in the wind or winter, all these other things. They have to deal with a lot more difficult conditions and degrade faster. But the big thing about batteries, right? Who wants to charge a trillion batteries also? Maybe there is a whole alternative industry of battery chargers, but we'll not get into that. So instead of batteries, our work, uh, as we hone in on solutions, potential solutions of reimagining, is thinking about these Internet of Things devices to be powered by energy that is harvested. So harvested from uh, movement, right? So think of the, the watches, you know, mechanically wind themselves. We can actually use that energy to do maybe smartwatch things. Uh, the sun, the wind, other more traditional things, even microbial fuel cells like soil itself. And then storing these in very tiny capacitors, just very simple electrical components, you know, a plate, two plates which hold a charge, right? There's no actual chemistry happening uh, that would make a battery degrade. Of course, what happens, and this is our, I had to sum up my entire research in a slide or two. The problem is this is the energy storage, um, or the mass of this energy storage is, you know, compared to the capacity of the battery in my phone. Uh, that mass of this African elephant in all its glory, compare that to the amount of energy storage and like a typical capacitor, it's this ant. And so there's a bunch of hard computational problems to navigate this difficulty. 
which you can read my PhD uh, if you like. Um, you'd be one of three people, so that'd be great. No. Uh, so this is what we call formally just intermittent computing. So what happens here is that I gather energy, I use that energy, then I die. Uh, the you know power uh, have a power failure. So how do I navigate a computer? And build software and systems and things like that for a computer that has lots of power failures uh, over time. All right. And that's a whole line of work uh, that sits down and helps enable a different way to think about these computational devices. So this does give us a way, though, because now we can take batteries out. We're removing one part of you know, the very high ecological waste of the Internet of Things. And then we're also enabling these devices because they're now power failure resilient to potentially last for decades, right? Now they can last instead of until the battery dies to when the uh, films on top of the print circuit board start to flake off, right? So there's much longer time periods for these to be useful. And if we can extend lifetime of devices, that's an obvious way to reduce um, the footprint. So a lot of this comes from our own, my definition of how to approach research. So I'm native Hawaiian and indigenous person. Um, and we think a lot about uh, seventh generation decision making. So that means we're trying to make uh, decision, decisions now that have positive societal, environmental, and health impacts seven generations uh, in front of us. Uh, and so that's for me interpreted as build computer systems that are sustainable, resilient, and useful for the entire lifetime of the people, places, and things that they support. And we call this sustainable computational things. Here's a, you know, a graphic of some of the little things that we built. From battery-free Game Boys to uh, you know year-long um, health trackers and Fitbits to prototyping platforms to help um, students kind of engage uh, with sustainable computing, and we try and approach this from a multifaceted area, from materials, devices, um, to also human-computer interaction, so that we're more aware of kind of how to holistically place what we're building uh, within the very large sphere that is sustainability. And that theme is maybe if we reduce these batteries in for the Internet of Things, then we will end up with a more maintenance free, more open, more programmable um, idea of com computing. And, but of course, we're going to have to rethink a lot of stuff. So I want to give you a hype video now on kind of what I think this could realize. So this is uh, an example of how we can build sustainable sensor networks for monitoring the environment. So this is the Kakagan Sloughs, which is a protected wetland that harbors uh, wild rice, which is a very culturally and ecologically important staple of the Anishinaabe tribes in the upper Midwest. So we can take battery-free sensors and support environmental justice to protect these wetlands and conservation areas. And then this also means we can have these devices last for decades, be managed by the people that are on the land themselves. So we can have even design provocation. So this is a, an interactive devices. This is the battery-free Game Boy. This is actually powered by your user action itself. As I'm pressing those buttons, Mario or Tetris blocks are falling. Um, so then this shows that you can have, you know, uh, ways to provoke or make people think about energy harvesting and sustainable battery-free devices in the actual sphere of things. So then. We can also look at how these types of computational sustainable things impact health. So I can have embedded devices in the uh, fabric that are attached to masks that can help me track mask fit. Uh, they can look at my biometric or different type of biometrics, um, like heart rate and respiration rate, um, help me, you know, remind me when I've been wearing the mask too long or when I should maybe take a break, get some water or fix it. Then we can also think about how we have these devices, but can we also train up and increase literacy in students and even original peoples of the US who were from the start interested in sustainability and conservation efforts? So this is me working with um, at you know a school where my family went many, many years ago on my island, uh, building devices that the students can take and use to capture uh, insights into the ecological level of this uh, fish pond, which was built 400 years ago by my ancestors to then enact resource management policies and inform their community. So that's kind of the ideas around sustainable um, computational things. Where we want to reduce the reliance on batteries, we want to harvest energy. We're taking out one of the kind of fundamental parts of these mobile devices that we've just relied on forever, a battery, and rethinking everything else above that so that we can have this lower impact, but still provide 
some type of useful function. Right? We don't want to take away the benefits of computing that we've been able to imagine, but we want to try and do it in a way that's not going to really wreck things. Oh, and I so I'll skip this a little bit. So what about data centers though? Um, so this is just a quick aside, and I'd be happy to point people to more work on this, but you know, we're looking at the Internet of Things and small devices, but there's an incredible amount of work looking at how we go beyond just efficiency for carbon optimization. This includes timing data center workloads um, based on the availability of actual renewable energy in the California grid. Um, also includes making very specialized types of processors that are much more efficient, and so this can evade kind of uh, Moore's law for very specific applications. Uh, and then also looking at the entire life cycle in terms of making decisions on point of use, um, as well as potentially informing different types of regulations or manufacturing processes that could help these devices last much longer. There's also been a lot of work in repurposing uh, servers and making the kind of longevity of these devices last for many decades versus you know replace everything every four years in a data center, uh, which is obviously quite a burden. So. I'll try and go through this and end um, with this project. So as a demonstration of you know, computing, right? we talked about how we can rethink computing uh, and redesign computing devices uh, to make, you know, reduce the carbon emissions, right? reduce the footprint. But we can also have to acknowledge that computing is a very powerful tool for data-driven sustainability and conservation efforts. Right? And in fact, this is probably the most well-known, right? Almost everyone associated with conservation uh, has some type of, you know, MATLAB script or Python or some remote sensing, um, satellite-based imagery, right? They're doing some type of thing to, to capture data with sensors and other modalities and then transform it into information, which is then used to uh, inform action, right? So this is kind of the type of project I'm talking about where, you know, we had a recent um, $5 million award from the NSF that helps us explore and equip uh, Native American uh, tribes in the upper Midwest with cyber infrastructure to protect this wetland system that they have you know, guarded and preserved and watched for many, many, many hundreds, uh, even thousands of years. Um, so again, this is this Ramjar protected uh, wetland called the Kakangan Slows, which is right on the um, bottom part of Lake Superior. It's actually uh, one of the world's only uh, freshwater delta systems is very, very cool, very unique, and one of the largest um, uh, reserves of wild rice, which used to actually cover uh, most of the upper um, upper North America. So the idea here was, can we build cyber infrastructure that can equip citizen scientists? Citizen scientists can be journalists, tribes, local communities. And so for our kind of example exploration, we wanted to look at something that really bound coastal resources, um, coastal resources, you know, being everything from uh, wild rice, but also uh, the Native American folks have uh, fishing and hunting privileges on these properties. And so what we found was, you know, there was a lot of care for this uh, wild rice, this monomen, because it was so sacred and important to different types of rituals and traditions as well as just subsistence, right? So this is actually an old um, picture of a document that was a, an, an assessment about 100 years ago by Albert Jenks of the reach of Monomen uh, wild rice across uh, the US. And you can kind of see like there is completely covered uh, uh, kind of the upper pass, you know, north, um, uh, above Oklahoma and this was gathered basically, Jenks sent hundreds of postcards asking about you know, what's the level of your rice crop? Is it there? Is it abundant? And then painted this picture for us about 100 years ago. Well, you can guess what has happened in about 100 years uh, because of climate change, but also because of development. Now wild rice is almost exclusively held in this region that's around you know, the upper um, western-ish, mostly Great Lakes. A little bit also of kind of Michigan side, but uh, this kind of keeps falling and falling back. And even in just the past five years, 10 years, you know, five to 10 years, uh, the rice, you know, places that are highlighted here have actually disappeared because of all these different changes in the ecosystem because of 
uh, less ice cover on Superior um, and all the other things that kind of happen from that. So what do we do? Well, we're building um, sensors that can help us understand, you know, different parts of this ecosystem. So basically at the most fundamental level, sense, take pictures, um, sit out and about in these large ecosystems and gather lots of data on the state um, continuously of an entire ecosystem, looking at everything from uh, ice cover to bird song uh, to the actual rice itself growing and also the um, non-indigenous plants, invasive plants that are growing with the white rice. So this is actually in partnership with a very large NSF project called SAGE, um, which is about to start its second iteration that's deploying a bunch of cyber infrastructure for things like wildfire monitoring as well that is linked with sustainability uh, with Argonne National Lab to handle these in, in a very important kind of next frontier of computing applications that are not just in the data center. So I'll kind of skip a little bit of this. And so here's kind of what this looks like. Um, of course, there's this is a large project. There's social scientists, education and outreach folks, but the cyber infrastructure itself looks a little bit like this. And this is kind of what we imagine as maybe a example of how we can partner with communities to help them enact different types of resilience uh, strategies. And even to make it very kind of pointed, use data gathered by this infrastructure to stop certain types of development or to enforce uh, tribal policies and legal obligations of the federal government to the tribes. Uh, and this, because they are protecting a wetland system, which in fact, I think it was, the figure was 80% of all wetlands in the globe are protected or on indigenous land, they can actually make a difference by keeping these places preserved and protected and also understanding why they are degrading and then managing resources to potentially fix this degradation, fix or mitigate. And so by a combination of remote sensing, so satellites um, and machine vision and image processing along with on-ground sensors and then uh, phone applications which allow you know, things like natural language processing and observations, we can uh, come up with different ways to use this data in partnership with legal and civics and uh, the tribes folks that are trying to understand what is happening. And so all of this informs these different processes so that we can understand these regional climate drivers like winter uh, and also the effects of development and compare this to historical data and even weather data to really un kind of like disambiguate all the ways this ecosystem is kind of connected, which you know, on, on the other hand too, helps build up very um, real science and foundations, as well as push forward a community's um, hopes and goals. So where's the progress? Well, we've been deploying, this is actually a lake, it's ice over, um, deploying some sensors on trees. I got to take a kayak out um, on the lake, so that is the benefit of being able to do field work as a computer scientist, which I guess is somewhat rare, so I count myself blessed. But there's really, from that angle, there's so many other things we need beyond just this. So we kind of talked right about these two different places, um, you know, redesigning the computing stack so that we can reduce the carbon burden, and then thinking of new applications that can enable data-driven sustainability. There are many, many other places from education, from health, building interactive devices as design provocations that our work focuses on to bring attention to ideas. But all of this kind of comes back to thinking about, you know, rethinking even uh, the ways that we build and use computers to reduce their impact. Oh, and then, yeah, it updated, sorry. And we're really just getting started and defining what this vision of the world could be. Uh, the work done has laid foundations in a lot of different areas, and at least now we have kind of an understanding of where we are in terms of, you know, the baseline uh, for computing. And now it's kind of just how many different things can we get support for, how many different types of reimagined systems can we deploy, and can we really push to partner with communities that have this knowledge on the ground to build uh, climate change degradation mitigations, uh, that are responsive to the community and to the ecosystems that they exist in. So I think as long as we're thinking about pushing forward this equitable vision and partnering across multiple disciplines, uh, we can be successful. I think there is a lot of reason for optimism, but there is a lot of work to be done. Um, and so that's the talk. Thank you, everyone. Um, and if there are any questions online or here, happy to answer.
So it would be interesting to hear how you doubt it could still work. Mm. And you said it's pretty rare, right, to do this kind of sit on the science and integrate it on computing. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit of your? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, it's. Um, Part of it happened, um, you know, I was interested in computing that uh, was physical, I guess. And so, you know, robots and wearables, like that seemed always cool. So then once something becomes, you know, this physical device, you know, and you're like, oh, I can maybe take this around. Unfortunately, a lot of labs, even if they will build a physical device, it doesn't actually get taken outside the lab. But we found just in talking to communities and friends and, you know, uh, everyone uh, that we kind of encountered about the work it was like, oh, this would be fun if we put it here. And I'm like, oh, but here is not in the university, <laughs> right? So that just kind of necessitated. It's like, okay, well, let's see if this, see if we can put our you know, money where our mouth is in terms of the device capability and see what happens when we actually push it outside the lab to integrate it. And so that was a fun challenge. Uh, and just out of the community need, I think, was what made it happen. But then also, you know, being able to partner with uh, people that it was their job to go out in the field, like field ecologists and others who are like, oh, I'm going to go out. Why don't you just come? Right. It was being, so I guess putting myself in a position where I can encounter with these, these folks and uh, have those opportunities, as well as finding a supportive advisor that liked to camp, that may be the 98% reason, <laughs> right, um, was how this eventually happened. But I think, yeah, with a, a lot of computing now, it feels like it is becoming more in the field because it's becoming so much more distributed. So I think this will actually just naturally happen more often as we see more devices integrated into everyday things, even if it's stepping out of your lab into, you know, the, uh, the Candida building or something um, and deploying a device. That's kind of a, a still a big step from what it used to be. So that's the message to the PhD students, just go outside. <laughs> <laughs> so the time change that uh, the effect of time change that you talked about uh, with regards to the device prompts, I think it's not limited to the US as recently. Mm -hmm. Pakistan it has like uh, they uh, focused on the flight and a lot of lives were affected, a lot of crops and uh, a lot of livestock was affected. So, and, and the, the people there are, are, are kind of uh, depending on the livestock. So, uh, it's not just about the US, it's, it's already um, all over the globe. So, so, so it's a major fun. global, yeah. major global problem. And, uh, and yeah, in many, in many cases too, it might be that um, their folks are even more dependent, like you said, like dependent on the livestock completely. Right for subsistence lifestyles, where many in the uh, Native American tribes are not necessarily dependent for the subsistence, but it's incredibly culturally important. Right? And so you have subsistence and culture, and maybe cyber infrastructure can, you know, help with both. Right? Also, it's good to see Assad, and congrats on the baby. <laughs> so. mm. Calculating the footprint of computing, who gets credit for those unrealized submissions that computing is the plane are taking place? So, wow. for example, you know that yeah. you, you compare computing to aircraft emission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and as we learned in the pandemic, you can trade computing emissions for aircraft emissions. Yeah. <laughs> and still accomplish much of what needs to be done. Yeah. So we who gets the credit for those on the That's interesting. I've not thought about that. And hmm. I mean, yeah, because I guess well, I guess the way I've thought about it is there will be like that credit, but then as soon as that credit happens, there becomes a new deficit because now you've freed up some other resource to then pursue another application right because like you know like new you know zoom went from zero to hero you know over a few years same with other teams and other video conferencing and so now that has just completely dominated i mean we've, we've seen entire like research areas spring up as well as fabs dedicated to like video specific processors but i don't know if that actually has 
has the cost of those video specific processors, which are pretty intense in terms of fabrication, uh, comparable to the amount of air travel or commute travel or something like that? That's a really interesting question. And but I, for me, I'm never going to give computing a pass. I'm just going to assume that it's probably worse. But, but it is an interesting thing to think, yeah, what are those like wash credits? I don't know what the answer to. Second question is, what happens if you have a computer that's going to be in a trillion? Yeah, trillion device. Yeah. Um, there was a comparison between sort of the data center being mm. elephant and the device being um, and then the idea was that to make these trillion processors more useful over a longer life, yeah. somehow yeah. shows a paradigm in which there's some go. And I'm thinking in nature, in mm. the natural system mm. that you presented, you know, the elephant. It's a massive creature and it lives for 50 or 100 years or whatever. It lives for. Right. But the ant lives for a month. Moments, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a season or something. And then, and then uh, so why not go the other way where mm -hmm. as you put these trillion things out into the environment, they have, they serve their purpose mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. moment. And then they, Evaporate. <laughs> yeah. Whatever they do, they yeah. into back into the primary elements. Yeah. Or first form. Yeah. No, I think that's a. Oh, sorry. Keep going. Well, so I'm just I'm just wondering what was yeah. sent, what was the uh, idea behind? Hey, I think we should make these much more long lived mm -hmm. rather than much more short lived. Yeah, so yeah, can we, we're, if we're going to have trillions of these devices um, and they won't supplant the data center, I don't think, I mean, I'd be surprised. Um, just the centralization of resources is, is much easier for logistics and things like that for these like other services. But if we have trillions of sensor devices, um, which is maybe a bad idea too, like I'm not, I don't know if that's a great idea, but let's assume that NVIDIA's CEO is right. Um, then yeah, honestly, I think there'll be a variety. Like we approach this from the perspective of if there's a trillion devices, uh, even if they are these like ephemeral types, right? Which I think it, people in our lab are working on that. We just had a PhD student, pastor PhD defense, working on these ephemeral, more biodegradable devices that would last for kind of an instance and an application, and then would you know poof into their components, and you could reuse those as components um, if they were like plastic components so kind of continuing to use it or just kind of turn into you know soil or other types of things right which i think is awesome and really interesting for both of those types though both the ones that last for a very long time um you know and for the ones that are ephemeral the battery was still a main uh, blocker and really what we were looking at is how can we for both of these devices capture energy from other mediums um, and repurpose it and use it for these devices for however long they would last. And so that's kind of the connection between the ephemeral and the long lived. The long lived will capture energy, do some things, stop working for a little bit, turn back on, do more things when it gets enough energy because you know the sun came out or a cloud passed over. But the ephemeral will maybe do the same thing, but it's more pointed towards a very specific application that may not last for much longer. Like you know, if I had a microphone <laughs> that I used and then when I was done, I just, you know, um, put it in the recycle bin and it just evaporated, right, for an this instance. Um, but yeah, I think there's a multitude of different ways that that vision of many devices could come to pass. I think the ephemeral biodegradable portion is very real. It's very challenging, um, of course, to, you know, enlist these different types of materials to make something that can be useful and also have this property of being reusable or able to dissolve. And then these other long-term um, sensors that we build are almost trying to replace existing things. It's like, well, if you have something that has a large battery that's in a manufacturing line, can we offer the same um, capabilities, but now you have no maintenance and this thing can just go and you don't have replacement costs. Yeah, and we could maybe pursue both of those 
given enough PhD students and NSF funding, of course. <laughs> yeah. There's a question online, but I think Michael mentioned that. So I can work on e-waste and also durability recycling the trade dots and you know, durability as a like, which we call longevity I think, as a solution. So it, it really it's interesting to look at um, what's the market and what's the business model. Um, because even if you build a device to have durability, it doesn't have market durability. It's a new generation coming out and yes. coming on to that. Yes. Then it doesn't work out. So yeah, it would be very interesting to look at. Uh, that landscape of internet of things and uh, maybe look at the potential for where durability would yeah. actually lead to a reduction in impact versus uh, versus maybe not because of market forces. So we have one comment and one question online. One comes from Scott Duncan saying, have you deployed or are you inclined to deploy okay. any sensors into the Georgia campus environment? Some researchers are doing that for some of the eco comments. And as far as I'm concerned, as quickly find, the campus of Kenya would be next, actually. There is a living, learning campus task force that would love to engage with you. Mm. So that's maybe a follow up to Scott. That's cool. And then you see the other question by. Yeah. M oh, yeah, Mike. Mike, Mike Biller. Yep. Hey, yeah. <laughs> We've been trying to get together, but I had a baby, and this is my one time on campus for like the next month. <laughs> um, one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to read it now. Oh, and, and Scott, thank you for that. I, I'm absolutely inclined, uh, over inclined even, to deploy sensors uh, anywhere they'll let me. And some places they won't, probably too. Um, and then, Beryl, uh, yeah, just uh, your comment, I, that's very interesting on obsolescence. We've talked about this, but more as like a, it seems like we'd have to overcome obsolescence, and it ends there, but we haven't been able to engage more fully in like the durability versus you know, market forces argument, which would be very interesting to guide kind of what we're doing. Um, all right, so what is the potential of uh, SI customization? So if you could customize SI, where are the obvious wins low hanging fruit in terms of your work and sustainability more generally? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the things I think about, um, which could of course be long conversations, are kind of adaptability. And so like, for like a typical processor, right, you can run at different speeds, of course, you know, you can go very slow, you can go very fast. And so some of the ways we've used a typical processor is we'll try and peg the speed uh, to the energy available um, that we can harvest. And that's really nice, right, because it well, it can be really nice because then we can always guarantee some level of operation, uh, which some level of operation could just mean listening for an anomaly. And so for some types of applications, that kind of dynamic scaling is really great. You don't die. Um, I'm really interested, though, in how we could even reconfigure parts of that system or have different levels of adaptation or have different SI customization to help us, uh, you know, trigger or react in a zero power way to different types of signals. So I think there's just like that customization level, once we get into that area, there's just almost too much of a richness of a space, but I definitely think the adaptation part, like energy comes in and it's volatile, and then you have some type of adaptation. The different ways we can mix that are very different uh, from traditional computing, and so I think that's where the rich space is and where we've been you know, lucky enough to publish a few pl uh, papers, but more on the software side. Um, it sounds like, Michael, we've got to have some, we'll get lunch soon, I promise. <laughs> like, I'll be around. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for a great question.